Good morning. Just got off the red eye after fasting yesterday, so hopefully I'm awake. Um, I'm going to discuss this morning maintenance therapy post-transplant myeloma, and I think it's an interesting topic. It's kind of ironic that I'm presenting this in that several years ago I presented the opposite view. So I guess that reminds me of my high school debates where we had to take both sides. So the goal of maintenance therapy in myeloma is to reduce the risk of relapse, extend progression-free survival, but I think we're really missing it because I think really the ultimate goal here is to improve overall survival. So we want to maintain the response achieved of following a new treatment with administration of drugs for a prolonged time period. But the treatment has to be convenient, it has to be safe and well tolerated, not short term, but long term. And really importantly, it has to be affordable. These are becoming very important issues in the healthcare system today. And as we have all of these newer agents that Ken just mentioned, we have to make sure that this maintenance therapy is not reducing the efficacy of the new treatments. And I don't even think we know what that's going to be with all of the new agents that have come about in the last 12 to 18 months. So in terms of the data we have, we'll be looking at efficacy in terms of PFS and overall survival, the tolerability of these agents, their safety. We'll be specifically looking at steroids, although it's really been used in combinations. The bisphosphonate data, first with pimidronate, and then with zoledronic acid more recently. And of course, the IMIDs, first thalidomide and more recently lenalidomide, and the data, albeit limited that it is, with bortezomib. Whoop. So the, the, uh, the data with thalidomide that we have uh, exists from about a decade ago. I'll be talking more about the Atal trial in a moment. There's data from Dr. Barlogi's group, the uh, transplant data with steroids, from the Australians, and then the European data with lockers, all suggesting some benefit, not only in terms of event-free or progression-free, but perhaps overall survival with long-term thalidomide from these single trials. We'll come back to the meta-analysis in a minute, different result. But certainly, the tolerability of long-term thalidomide, we all know, it's just not a very well-tolerated drug. In terms of the French data with pimidronate, this is a large post-transplant trial in which patients, after receiving VAD, the V in those days, with vincristine, with Adrian Dex, high-dose therapy with melphalan times two, and then either pimidronate with thalidomide, pimidronate alone, or no treatment. And in the bottom left, there was an overall survival advantage to the combination of the bisphosphonate and thalidomide compared to the bisphosphonate alone or no treatment arm. One could argue it was the combination of both and that thalidomide alone would not do anything. We certainly don't know that from this data. The MRC, as you probably know, have completed a rather remarkable study demonstrating the efficacy of zoledronic acid. This large trial involving nearly 2,000 patients who were, had several randomizations. I'll show you the thalidomide one momentarily. But they looked at also zoledronic acid versus clodronate until progression, and then it was dealer's choice on what to do with the bisphosphonate. And the data clearly showed an improvement of both overall survival as well as progression-free survival with long-term zoledronic acid. And I've certainly seen individual cases of patients who have responded to zoledronic acid alone. Now, the same group then published subsequently the data on thalidomide maintenance within that trial. So they used a very low dose, 50 milligrams, bumped it to 100 by a month. And the median PFS among all patients was longer 23 months in the thalidomide arm versus 15 months in the no treatment arm. And then the subgroup, the half that were randomized to transplant, there also was an improvement, 30 months with thalidomide, 23 months with no treatment. However, the median overall survival among all randomized months was identical in both arms with or without thalidomide, 60 months. And then if you tease out the transplant randomized patients, there was no difference in overall survival, the p-value 0.26. And in fact, among the patients with high-risk cytogenetics, the thalidomide actually shortened their overall survival. 
So moving on to lenalidomide, the seminal study was done by the CLGB. So this study involved patients who had, importantly, seen it imid during their induction therapy, it had high dose melphalan stem cell transplant, and patients who did not progress were randomized to lend maintenance indefinitely at 10 or placebo. And first, the study clearly demonstrated an improvement in overall in progression free survival, as you see here, the red line special. I guess you could say the red state special is lenalidomide, the blue state special, placebo, showing the improvement. And in addition, unlike any other trial to date, there was an improvement in overall survival with a p-value at 0.03. The French have also conducted a similar study among patients who received a variety of inductions therapies, then stem cell transplant, consolidation with lenalidomide alone at 25 milligrams, and then moved on to either placebo or lenalidomide at 10 or 15 milligrams. And this study, again, showed an improvement in progression-free survival. And you'll note there was a stopping of the len after three years. There was a fear as the data was emerging regarding secondary primary malignancies in these groups of patients on len. And we did see a difference in PFS, but as you see here, there was absolutely no difference in overall survival. And those curves don't separate at all during the duration of this trial. However, there was a markedly higher risk of secondary primary malignancies, and you see the Kaplan-Meier plot as it moves over 10% by about three or four years out from enrollment in the trial. Particularly, these were bad cancers, as you know, especially heme malignancies. Now, our chair here, Dr. Palumbo, published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine a tandem transplant trial in which patients were randomized into four arms following Len and Dex induction for four cycles. They either received MPR and then lenalidomide maintenance, or MPR no maintenance, or two transplants and lenalidomide maintenance, or two transplants and no maintenance therapy. And you'll note, how, you'll note that from the time of diagnosis, on the left-hand side, there is a definite improvement in the solid black line demonstrating a better progression-free survival if you get high-dose melphalan times two and LEN maintenance. But on the right side, you'll note there's absolutely no difference in overall survival among these four arms. So even versus MPR with no maintenance, we didn't see a difference in survival. Now, if you look specifically at the patients who were randomized to receive maintenance therapy or not, again, on the left-hand side, you are seeing this improvement in progression-free survival. But on the right-hand side, there is absolutely no difference in overall survival in those randomized to receive land maintenance versus those who were not randomized to receive maintenance treatment. Recently, the same group, the Italians, have looked in a randomized trial just published in Lancet Oncology in patients overall 389, 223 got to maintenance phase. These patients received four cycles of Lendex and they were randomized to one of four arms, either cyclophosphamide Lendex with maintenance Len at 10, with steroids or not, based on a trial I published about a decade ago about the efficacy of steroids as a maintenance treatment following VAD. And the other group was tandem transplant, again, with maintenance LEN with or without prednisone at the same dose and schedule. The results showed that maintenance therapy with LEN alone was equivalent to maintenance therapy with LEN with prednisone, both in terms of progression-free and overall survival, but obviously doesn't tell us whether LEN worked or not. Now, we've recently conducted a meta-analysis with Dr. Wong's group at MD Anderson looking at over 7,000 patients in the 18 randomized phase three trials who had received either lenalidomide or thalidomide as maintenance treatment. Clearly, there is an absolute improvement in progression-free survival that was demonstrated in our analysis. But there was no improvement in overall survival. And in the transplant setting, both lenalidomide and thalidomide, again, improved progression-free survival. 
but there was no improvement in overall survival either in taking the data all together or teasing out LEN alone p-value 0.477 or THAL alone 0.343 and there was a markedly higher risk of grade three and four adverse events, as you well recognize, thromboembolic events, deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and peripheral neuropathy limited to the thalidomide-treated patients, and then, of course, as we know, secondary primary hematologic malignancies, and those patients who receive LEN maintenance therapy from these trials. So lenalidolide maintenance therapy in the transplant setting, consistent improvement in progression-free survival. However, only one trial, the CLGB trial, has shown an improvement in overall survival. Our meta-analysis shows absolutely no difference in OS. And the disadvantages of this long-term treatment, the risk of secondary primary malignancies, particularly hematologic malignancies, and I've seen them, the high rate of side effects, including what we don't talk about a lot, quality of life effects on cognitive function, and what we really don't know the answer to, what does this long-term treatment do to the ability of us to treat that clone eventually that may be drug resistance? We do not know in the setting of all the new treatments that Ken just mentioned, the ones that are coming. And last but not least, the high cost of chronic therapy that's really not having any impact in overall survival. So in terms of bortezomib, there isn't a lot of data, and it certainly isn't data you could use to make you feel comfortable using bortezomib maintenance. There's a HOVON trial from Dr. Sonnefeld's group. A lot of patients randomized, as you see, to either VAD or PAD, but unfortunately, the randomization was two times, was only, I should say, once, but they got different maintenance therapies depending on which arm. So the PAD patients received continued bortezomib and the VAD patients received thalidomide. And although both the progression-free and overall survival were improved among patients who received bortezomib induction and maintenance, we have no idea whether that's from the induction or the maintenance or both from the results of this trial. We also have data from Dr. Rosenel's trial from the Spanish group, bortezomib as maintenance therapy this uh, trial had two randomization, induction randomization, which I won't go into. Patients then had high-dose therapy, and there was a second randomization to either bortezomib with thalidomide, thalidomide alone, or interferon. And after three years, there was, a, there was no difference between the arms in overall survival, but marked toxicity. So maintenance therapy for the other drugs, we really do not know the answer. This is going on with current trials with some of these, especially exazomib, it'll be interesting to see the results. And in my last slide, although maintenance therapy with lenalidomide post-transplant improves progression-free survival, it has had no impact on overall survival. There are significant side effects and tolerability issues. It's rather expensive, as we well know. And we don't know what it's going to do in terms of inducing resistance to the new drug therapies we have. Some data suggests that IV bisphosphonates may be effective, but it's limited. And I've already told you the limitations of the trials that have been done with bortezomib. So ongoing studies with new agents will be very interesting. But at this point, the use of maintenance therapy for myeloma patients in the post-transplant setting should be quite limited. Thank you.